November 28, 2018, Artifact was released. Designed by one of the grandfathers of trading card games and published by one of the most successful and innovative video game companies of the 21st century, a full year of anticipation from the game's initial announcement was laden with praises by card game figureheads and industry professionals. Artifact's gameplay promised a deep strategic experience that was easy to pick up and hard to master. And with additional promises of a mobile version and a million dollar tournament in the first quarter of the following year, many were expecting a smash hit. What was to follow was anything but. This is the story of Artifact's launch. August 8, 2017. On day two of the International, rumors began circulating that Valve would announce a brand new game. At that point, Valve's sizable library included nothing but critically acclaimed titles, all of which fans would welcome a sequel for. So it's no wonder this rumor began to stir excitement. After all, it had been five years since a new Valve title had released. This announcement, however, would be something that not even the biggest Valve fan could anticipate. The lights dimmed in the arena. The teaser began. In it, some moving stones, a dramatic soundtrack, and ultimately the title of the game. Artifact. Subheading. A Dota card game. That crowd reaction would go viral, and perhaps indicative of events to come. Claims of Valve jumping on the card game bandwagon spread, alongside warranted skepticism of a new title in such an already saturated market. However, excitement slowly began. Valve was known for their innovative takes on old ideas, and it was clear that if anyone could come in swinging on an already established genre, it would be the brilliant minds behind Portal and Half-Life. Verbal accounts of the game would follow the release teaser. This game, anything you see in Dota, it's here. There's not just one board, but three boards. You control five heroes, deploy them among the different lanes, creep, spawn every turn. The heroes that you play in Dota, they're in the game. You can play as Bounty Hunter and cast track on an enemy hero. Killing it gives you extra gold. Use the gold to buy item cards, equip them to your heroes. And I gotta say, it's a really cool experience because you really feel like the commander. It would not be until five months of complete silence from the developer that at the beginning of March in 2018 we would see Artifact's first gameplay. Reporters from prominent gaming news outlets were invited to Valve's offices in Bellevue, Washington for the opportunity to be the first members of the public to play the game. Only handheld footage was allowed to be taken during this time. The first gameplay videos of Artifact had a mixed response. First and foremost, it was clear that this was a Valve game with the Valve polish that they were known for. It had excellent art direction combined with expressive animations. The innovation was in the form of the three-board nature of the game, which was not the first of its kind. The Elder Scrolls card game also shared a multiple board layout. However, Artifact's Dota 2 theming was more appropriate for the mechanic. Three lanes, three boards. Jokes and thinly veiled concerns began stirring that Valve wanted players to play three card games at once, as the complexity of the gameplay became more and more apparent. Most of these concerns would be quickly dismissed. Valve seemed to want to treat fans of the card game genre with something different, as even though the card game genre was deeply saturated, it was unfortunately prone to a lack of evolution. Hearthstone, the biggest success in its field, became the giant it is by offering a low skill floor. But here Valve was showing something that was not only hard to parse at a glance to a new player, but also seasoned veterans of the card game genre. A presentation was given at this event by none other than Valve's own CEO, Gabe Newell, describing their expectations and thought process moving forward with Artifact. The requirement for Dota, I mean for Artifact, was to build the best possible card game, right? It wasn't to build a Dota 2 card game, right? The Dota 2 teams didn't say, oh look, everybody else, they've got card games, we should have one too. The Artifact team was like, let's go build the best card game, and they said, out of the available IPs that we have, which one is most appropriate, you know? Mr. Newell would continue on to state that they envisioned Artifact to be a game where power did not correlate to rarity. Investment in the game would reward the player and that it would move away from being pay to win. Every card game player is aware of these problems and most players outside of the genre are hesitant to approach because of them. The trepidation that Valve could not tackle such major concepts was set aside. If anyone could do it, it was Valve. Here, he would announce a mobile version and a $1 million tournament in the first quarter of 2019. However, at this presentation, the most notable reveal was that Artifact was a design by none other than Richard Garfield. Mr. Garfield is renowned for his success in the card game genre, extremely prolific and widely praised for his hits like Netrunner, Keyforge, and the most successful paper card game in history, Magic the Gathering. This was the icing on top of the cake, the most successful card game designer combined with one of the most critically acclaimed publishers. Garfield's name would be plastered on any future news piece covering the game, and Artifact's small fan base began to grow exponentially as the designer became known. At this press event and subsequent interviews going on until the game's release in November, Garfield would reveal his vision for the game. The electronic games that had electronic card games that had been 
made to that point much simpler than paper card games. And that seemed like a shame because you've got this resource, a computer, which could handle much more complicated things than a tabletop. And so uh, I had some mechanical ideas for how to keep the game flowing because there are these issues, for instance, with magic. When you make magic into an electronic card game, there's a lot of things which don't work as well electronically as they do over a tabletop. You constantly have to be on the alert for what your opponent's going to do so you can interrupt the action at any time. And so mechanical things like that had been... Uh, uh, when thinking about them in other products, it had made the games become simpler, I think, than a lot of the uh, game players were looking for. The press tour continued. More Valve Giants revealed their participation in the project. Brandon Reinhardt, the project manager, originally a programmer working on Epic Games on Unreal Tournament and now involved in the design of Team Fortress 2 and Dota 2. Jeep Barnett, a programmer on and a member of the original team that made Narbacular Drop, who were all hired to create Portal as a result. Bruno Carlucci, a legendary caster and analyst for Dota 2, later hired full-time for software development at Valve, and many more. These were the type of people working on Artifact, industry icons, further accelerated by the fact that Valve's flat management structure meant that these people were working on Artifact out of their own interest. Despite this, all was not peachy amongst Artifact's public perception. Slowly, Artifact began to develop a stigma. From the very first reveal of Artifact at the International, it was clear that regardless of the quality of the product, Artifact was not what Valve's core fanbase wanted out of the developer. Frustration and anger stemmed from diehard Valve fans who were looking for a sequel to one of their single-player titles. Who asked for this? Valve. It could have been anything. So after so much time has passed since Valve launched their last acclaimed title, it is fully understandable to be disappointed when their new game turns out to be their own version of Hearthstone. My favorite internet comment was this person who said, Well done, Valve. Not only can you not count to three, you can't even be counted on. Oof. Tough crowd. Around this time during the press rounds, it would be revealed that several digital card game figureheads and streamers were being gradually invited to play an NDA-laden closed alpha of the game. The selection of invitees was wide, successful card game players made sense, but big-name Dota personalities and contenders were also brought in. Furthermore, reports of esports teams officially signing on artifact players began to surface, some of which would also be selectively granted alpha access. Those that did have access to the game would speak highly of it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to artifact. It's gonna be like an eSports card game, you know? Pretty hyped. There's finally an eSports card game. That is a lot of play and counterplay, and I think you guys are gonna love it. Yeah, I can't talk about that game too much, but I'm really excited for it. I think Artifact will be a, an excellent game. An era of thinly veiled elitism began to emanate from Artifact's core community. Criticisms of the game's perhaps unnecessary depth was rebutted with fans claiming that this was the game's primary selling point. Claims of a lack of mass appeal was met with disdain for even insinuating the idea that it was something to strive for. The concept of a closed group of people playing this highly anticipated game and giving their praise only added to the effect that Artifact was not for everyone. From the initial announcement at the International, it was rumored that Valve would integrate their Steam Marketplace into Artifact. This made sense. The infrastructure was already there, and it was a proven success by its implementation in titles like Counter-Strike Global Offensive and Team Fortress 2. Additionally, this transactional nature was a traditional aspect of trading card games. Card game stores to this day offer a similar service. Confirmation of Artifact's inclusion in the Steam Marketplace was made loud and clear at the press event. Alongside was the announcement that while cards were able to be put up on the market and similarly bought off by players, they would not be tradable, meaning that all card transactions that would occur in Artifact would have to go through the marketplace, and more importantly have their value deducted by the Valve Tax, a cut that the developer takes with every transaction. This news was universally met with distaste. With this system, intentional or not, a player's collection would slowly depreciate in value over time, assuming they would sell and buy cards as needed. This meant that a player would periodically have to input money or earn packs into their collection. But strange revelations on Artifact's economy did not end there. Yet another bombshell that was dropped at this press event by the CEO was that Artifact would launch with a $20 price tag. Almost unheard of in the current digital card game space, a paywall to begin playing is quite the deterrent for new players. Despite the fact that the value of digital goods that would be received on launch amounted to more than $20, being 10 packs priced at $2 each and 5 tickets valued at $5. Speaking of new players, the Dota 2 audience seemed to be the primary marketed demographic, from being announced at the International to the Dota 2 IP being used to an in-game marketing push on the game map. What was clear was that Valve wanted the Dota 2 audience to see Artifact and participate in it. What wasn't clear was their pitch. 
The Dota community is used to getting their gameplay components all at once and for free, as is the system in Dota 2. The monetization model of a card game and by extension Artifact is the polar opposite of such system. However many Dota fans did end up playing Artifact, many more disregarded the game entirely thanks to its economy. August 1st, 2018. Nearly a year since the last tweet that the official Play Artifact Twitter account sent out, an announcement was made that Artifact would be playable at PAX West, a popular gaming expo later that month. Also revealed was that this event, participants would be given codes that would grant access to Artifact's beta, which was scheduled in October, providing a month of in-advance access. During this period, many more streamers and card game professionals came out of the woodwork to reveal that they have been playing in the closed alpha. Positive feedback across the board, but with doubts of mass appeal. For career Hearthstone players, this was at a time when the metagame was feeling pretty stale, so many were eager for something new or some reason to switch games. Believing that Artifact would be the next big thing, many announced their switch. So, I have made the choice to move to Artifact. The people were hungry. The genre's saturation meant that people were looking for something new, and seemingly Valve was willing to provide. If feedback about the game was to be believed, then nothing could stop Artifact. The month of August was home to many further revelations. Gabe Newell took the stage at the International 8, a full year after the game's first initial teaser, and revealed that all attendees would be granted free beta access to Artifact. If you've linked your ticket to your account, you'll get a free copy of Artifact. Quite the different reaction from the year previous. August 31st, 2018. PAX West began. It was revealed beforehand that only four pre-constructed decks would be available to play. This was still enough new content that people haven't seen to get interest raging. On day two of the event, an official stream began highlighting the game between attendees of the event and casters. Casting the event were major Dota 2 figures. Valve was in the fortunate position where they could shift some of their Dota personalities to Artifact to curate the scene with some of their great talent. It was let slip during this time that Valve was hosting weekly private tournaments for alpha testers, with generous prize pools going up to $10,000. It seemed that Valve cared and wanted their alpha testers to put their best minds to the game and push it to the limit. Artifact at PAX was a success in its purpose. Anticipation was at an all-time high, but the keys handed out at the event were at an all-time high demand as well. In general, beta codes are a good method of generating excitement about a product. They are artificially scarce and can easily be distributed to content creators, who in turn can promote themselves and the product at the same time. It's a system that works, but can create many frustrating outlier situations. Seeing the success that the beta key system had for Dota 2's beta, it made sense that Valve would employ a similar system for Artifact. However, as expected, and similarly to what happened to Dota, a secondary market developed. Keys could range and would sell from anywhere to $50 to upwards of $400 on eBay. Perhaps more than any Anything, this was indicative of the level of hype that was generated around Artifact. The fear of missing out on the next big game caused many to look for any chance they could to begin playing the game early, and practicing for the big esports scene that was seemingly on the horizon. In fact, at this point in time, this was a growing concern from the community. Understandably, many of the big names invited in the closed alpha were major card game competitors that planned on competing themselves in the esports scene upon the game's release. Concerns were brought up that these players would have an unfair advantage going into launch, and that perhaps even the constructed metagame would be solved going in. Regardless if these concerns were rooted in truth, they did fuel the growing dissent. The elitist stigma that Artifact was developing was certainly not helped by the key system. More than ever, fans of Artifact were considered pompous with their private clubs, complex gameplay, and willingness to abide by the game's economy. After PAX, a spoiler season began. Important figureheads in the scene got their share of cards, but surprisingly, Valve did provide some new and up-and-coming content creators card spoilers as well. Some did get their spoilers taken from them by some of the many leaks that came out, but regardless, Valve was being more generous than usual during spoiler season. In fact, community involvement was at an all-time high from the developer, from accepting interviews to their social media presence, which was extremely unusual. Reviews of the gameplay was stellar, but all the fans had to go on was blind faith at this point. As a clearer picture of the first set began to form, some took matters into their own hands and printed out the cards to play the game physically. Others took to creating their own digital versions of the game through JavaScript apps and Tabletop Simulator. The Tabletop Simulator mod really highlighted just how dedicated the fans were to playing Artifact. An average game of Artifact at the time took about 15 to 20 minutes, but a game in Tabletop Simulator, where you had to manually execute some of the more strenuous mechanics, a game could take anywhere from an hour 
Plus. Some signed Artifact Pros would reveal months later that they used Tabletop Simulator to practice for the Pro scene when no other option was available. However, fans decided to pass the time, the end of October was coming closer and closer. And while communication was at an all-time high from the official Play Artifact Twitter account, no new information about the keyed beta was being revealed. Then finally, on October 19th, players who had entered a beta key into their accounts received an email that read that the game would be open on November 19th, only nine days before the release of the game, significantly shorter than the previously promised month. This news, while disappointing for many, was not unexpected. Valve has developed a reputation for delaying their projected dates, a phenomenon dubbed Valve Time. A heavier burden to bear for those that spent an exorbitant amount on a key, the general reception was that if this was what it took for a polished end product, so be it. Set 1 was now revealed in its entirety, and many clamored for a stream of one of those exclusive private tournaments that Valve was hosting. A surprise to all, Valve listened. Hosted by Beyond the Summit, the event would take place on the weekend of November the 10th, about three weeks prior to launch. To highlight a previously unseen game mode, the format would be draft. Day 1 of the tournament did not go over well for casual fans. Additionally, being the first official tournament of Valve's new title, many more tuned in to see exactly what all the fuss was about. To the majority of uninformed viewers with a casual interest, the rapid fire of terminology lead and casting formed a confusing and comprehensible stream. Artifact's first tournament nosedived the public perception further. While the issue was rectified the next day after feedback, the complexity of Artifact was perpetuated further. The tournament would continue without a hitch, but it would never recover its day one viewership. Beta was creeping closer, and while alpha testers were free to talk about the game and its strategies, they were still barred by NDA to stream the game itself. However, it was announced that the weekend before the beta release on November the 17th, the NDA would be dropped and those in the alpha would be free to stream the game. This day would be the biggest surge of popularity that Artifact had thus far. Nearly every card game figurehead and popular streamer that was involved in the alpha streamed the game to their audience. However, with the beta only being the following Monday, a clear picture of Artifact at launch was formed. Artifact will be too complex for the casual Hearthstone viewer. I think Artifact is a bad game and is the only card game I've, like, it's one of the only card games I've ever played where I would say that. Registered, constructed, and unregistered. Wow, they got rid of draft. That is, um, something we weren't allowed to share with you guys. I will be really disappointed if, um, the economy ends up being just, like, the biggest shortcoming of the game. Because I really actually enjoy the game itself. But, I mean, they can't release it like this. The biggest offender in the eyes of the community was the lack of a free draft mode between players. Other digital TCGs offer a virtual currency that can be generated by the player by completing daily or weekly objectives, which could then be redeemed for a draft entry. Artifact had no such virtual currency. A free draft mode was in the game but only against bots, so the only way for players to play against each other was spending money on a ticket. This outcry combined with additional concern from alpha testers got our first update post on November 18th, only one day from beta launch. Valve stated that in response to the community's concerns, a free non-prize draft mode would be available, alongside a new light crafting system that lets you convert unwanted cards down to an event ticket. This response was prompt and a breath of relief to anyone involved in the game. While not solving some of the more glaring holes present, it was a good response to lead the beta off. Wait, wait, wait. Yo, you can scrap unwanted cards into event tickets? This feature will ship before the end of the beta period. So that means in like 10 days, right? Oh, okay. So they, they saved the game. Praise Gaben. November 19th, 2018. The artifact closed beta for key holders was released. After a little over a year of anticipation since the game's announcement, the key holding public could finally play Artifact. Smooth was the launch, however previous game problems which were either disregarded or lacked a first-person perspective began to make themselves apparent. Core gameplay problems were brought up, such as the game not clearly telegraphing why exactly a play you made caused you to win or lose. Another complaint was the feeling of a lack of player agency involved when the game dictates the direction that your units attack and spawn. This was in contrast to the players who enjoyed these mechanics, saying that the telegraphing is learned with time and the game is designed to put you on your feet by reacting to the random components. Outside of the gameplay, the three big points that Gabe Newell wished Artifact to address were not tackled, these being power not correlating to rarity, moving away from being pay to win, and reward for investment. A problem that affects most TCG systems, power has to correlate to rarity in order for a draft format to function properly. Valve themselves even went through this conundrum when they had to increase Luna's rarity from common to uncommon, and increase Drow's rarity from uncommon to rare in response to feedback. Other games tackle this problem by having rarity correlate to the complexity level of the card, wherein skill is the determinant of whether or not the card ends up being powerful. In Artifact at launch, many of the cards that ended up being powerful staples in the constructed format were at the highest rarity. 
Pay to win is a more complicated concept within the scope of card games. At its most base definition, artifact and by extension all card games could be called pay to win, simply because there is an option to pay money to circumvent effort that a player not paying will have to go through. While it would be more appropriate to call artifact pay to compete, since the desired outcomes of gameplay are different per player, it's a topic for a different discussion. Artifact did not provide enough ways for players to acquire cards beyond spending money. Regardless of whether or not this was because they cared about the economy of the Steam marketplace or because they were greedy, at launch, the only way to keep growing your collection without having a good win rate was to pay. This ties into the last point that Gabe Newell said that Artifact was to address, reward for investment. Now, even though Gabe Newell was talking about this in regards to a player focusing on improving on various gameplay points and being rewarded for it, it is still relevant, but on a grander scale. One of the most egregious holes that Artifact launched with was the lack of a reason to keep coming back. Disregarding the discussion on whether or not a game needs to have auxiliary objectives to be worthwhile, most if not all card games today have some sort of daily or weekly objectives to keep the player engaged and returning. Artifact was in a dilemma. Valve did not want to put free cards into the game's economy as not to tank their overall value. And with a lack of any cosmetics or similar fluff, there was nothing else that they could provide the player to feel rewarded. November 28, 2018. Artifact launched. Designed by one of the grandfathers of trading card games and published by one of the most successful and innovative video game companies of the 21st century. Sporting critically acclaimed gameplay and promises of an esports scene, Artifact launched with a player count of over 60,000. For all its shortcomings and missing features, Artifact did many things right. The art direction, soundtrack, and polished proved that this was the work of a AAA developer. The comics released during the beta period and launch were wonderfully drawn and written, both setting up and fleshing out the world of Artifact. Each card was expertly voice acted and individual cards could have upwards of 200 voice lines that could play in-game. While many disliked the gameplay loop, many more enjoyed the strategic depth and swingy nature of the games. While many strayed far away due to the monetization model, many more enjoyed playing the market and selling their cards for Steam cash. While Artifact was not something that the Valve audience wanted, it still had the level of detail and execution that they were known for. You could say that Artifact's biggest fault was that it was a niche experience for a niche audience in a niche genre. Artifact's story post-launch is still being written. Player numbers dropped significantly after release, and even with sizable updates that tried to address many of its issues, by the end of 2018 it never did recover its player count. A disappointing launch, but with problems not unfixable. Only time will tell what becomes of Valve's take on a genre as old as gaming itself. What I would say the most exciting thing about watching people jump in, it hasn't led to changes, but it's, it's, it's sort of gotten me very excited, is this sort of constant feedback that this game really appeals to me, I want to play it again, but I don't think anybody else will play it because it's too complicated. And when you get that again and again, it, it feels really uh, special because you're, you're getting all these people saying this is something which appeals to me, but I'm not sure whether, you know, whether it's going to be broadly appealing. That's sort of some sort of secret sauce there.